Good, good, good. good. Hey, Amen. We got faces in the building. <laughs> Woo! Because uh, staring at that screen. I, I still got to look at the screen. But uh, the, the, the camera, it's like, you know, when you don't have any faces in here, it's like, oh, yeah, okay. And face, I'm imagining all you guys' faces. But it is so awesome uh, when the saints gather. It really is. There's a, such an energy and a cohesiveness when we're worshiping together, hands lifted, eyes closed, hearts open. It is awesome. Uh, I'm going to be talking about... A different gospel today. Very simple, but I, I believe it has uh, very powerful and spiritual implications for us. Um, uh, let me pray. Lord, we love you. We ask for a demonstration of your power. And uh, God, I just ask that you would touch us with the simple message of the gospel, what you did for us on the cross, and how it um, speaks to us today, and how it shows us how we ought to live until you come and get us. Father, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would touch every heart. Even little kiddos on their devices, Holy Spirit, touch their little hearts, speak and deposit seeds of the Word of God in their spirits as we worship and uh, 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 open your Word today. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So Pastor Jeff has been talking about uh, our mission and the uh, pitfalls that comes and tries to steal our mission. I believe that our main mission, and I, I think you would agree, is to preach the gospel. I think Francis of a something, yes, a CC, said, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. The gospel is power to salvation. And if I'm story with anything today, is it's to see the gospel prevail and overcome into every heart, no matter age, no matter uh, 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 gender, race, whatever, the power of God on display uh, through the gospel and just as our purposes fit in God's promises of his word, so should our mission in the Great Commission. Whatever we fall in life, CEO, pastor, I got my construction company, whatever, personal trainer, it should fall in line with the Great Commission. Yes. Now, here's the deal. The Great Commission has to involve the gospel. <laughs> we cannot fulfill the Great Commission without knowing, believing, preaching, and living out the true gospel. Someone lives out and builds their life around what they believe, rather good or bad. What you believe, you'll start to live out. So what we believe about Jesus or the gospel uh, will not only set and steer the course of our lives, but will be in direct correlation with how we live them out. What I believe about Jesus, I will live it out. If I have one concept of Jesus, I'm going to live it out that way. If I only know him as shepherd... I'm going to walk out my life that way. If I only know his, him as Savior, not Lord, I'm going to walk out my life that way. Now, the gospel I'm talking about, hallelujah, is the good news. No sin, no Satan, no injustice. All of it's gone. That's the gospel. Hello. Oh, I, listen, if you like me, I am tired of being tempted. Bitterness, envy, jealousy, there will be a day, <laughs> there will be a day, sin will tempt me no longer. There will be no injustice, there will be no Satan, eternal glory forever. Me and Jesus forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. <laughs> Beloved, that is important for someone to know. That will break off shame and condemnation in a moment if you know where you're going. Today, we got different forms of the gospel. What do you mean, Kay? You mean there's different gospels going on? Oh, yeah. There's very different gospels going on. Why? I don't know. I don't know why. But Paul tells us that there's a different gospel. But before I go into that different gospel, there was five common characteristics that uh, when the gospel was preached by Jesus, Peter, and Paul, there were at least five common characteristics. The person of Jesus as fully God and fully man, both Lord and Savior. The reality of the kingdom, both now and to come. The message of the cross, Jesus' atoning death, burial, and resurrection. Forgiveness of sins through repentance and faith in Jesus as the Messiah alone. Jesus as judge and the judgment to come. Now, hear me, hear me. Judgment. <laughs> Don't, like, everyone tells somebody here's judgment, like, ugh, 
It's like, ugh, judgment. But judgment is, uh, is awesome because we get rewarded. How we live on this earth, we will be rewarded in heaven forever. And for eternity, people will know how we live while on the earth forever. It doesn't matter how many followings you have, whether in a congregation or on Facebook or Instagram, that will not matter in eternity. In eternity, obedience, submission to the Lord as both Savior and Lord, obedience, worship, prayer, your life given over day after day, moment after moment, that is what stores up treasures in heaven, beloved. And you will always be remembered that way, how you lived on the earth. Now, the problem is we got different gospels, and when different gospels lead you a different way to a different Jesus. And the reason why I'm so stirred on this is because Paul said that uh, he labors in the uh, defense and the confirmation of the gospel. It is our uh, job as professing believers and disciples of Jesus Christ to defend the gospel. And you defend it by preaching it and living the true one. Paul says this in Galatians 1, 6 to 9. Let's read that up there. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not there is another one, but there are some who trouble and, and who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, Paul is saying this, or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you. Let him be accursed. Paul is very serious about this, if you're not tracking. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. If that's not enough for you, in 2 Corinthians 11, 3 through 4, he says, for I feel a divine jealousy for you. So when he's saying this, he goes, God, I preach to you. I see a sound conversion in you. I see you really go after Jesus after the gospel was preached. He goes, but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his coming, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaim, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you may put up with it. A different gospel. Beloved, we are in urgent times. And it is imperative that we stay true to the gospel. It is imperative. It is the only way. By the way, these five characteristics were endorsed by God with power. It had God's power coming behind it when they preached the true gospel, the clear-cut gospel where it pierced 3,000 souls. That's power. Let's look at these seven uh, different gospels. You know, when I think of a different gospel, I think of something that how is majored on one characteristic, minored on everything else. We major in one characteristic, but we need a healthy diet of the knowledge of God and the gospel. We need a healthy diet. When we don't have a healthy diet, we get, start to get malnourished in the knowledge of God. We, 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 um, we start to see him in a different light when stuff hits the fan. In our life, if we don't know him completely. Now, I'm not saying having perfect knowledge of God. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about I got a healthy diet of him as Savior, him as Lord, him as judge, him as king. I have a healthy diet of these attributes and characteristics of him. You know, um, we were talking about this in our men's Bible study on Zoom. Uh, and a lot of people come to the altar they may even have an emotional experience with tears and actually feel something. But yet when they walk out of these doors, they still do the same thing the next day. So when I see a, a false gospel or a different gospel being preached, I think of it as gives no new heart or new nature. 
It doesn't break the power of sin, but allows one to continue in it. It only gives an insurance policy against hell and nothing about holiness of thought or action. It lets you indulge in the flesh and puts no restraint on your passion, pride, or evil heart. It says that all one has to do is say yes to the common spiritual laws and believe in a historical Jesus. And after he believes, he's saved forever no matter what he does. Beloved, that is a lie. That is a lie from the pit of hell. First John says, back up your actions by being obedient to my commands because it shows that you love me. I just paraphrased that verse, so don't shout me down now. That, that verse is paraphrased. <laughs> if you love me, obey me. Perfectly? No. But, man, my heart's reach is, ah, I'm going to get it next time, Lord. I'm going to love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'm going to get this right. Because your blood and your sacrifice, what you did for me on the cross, is worthy of me reaching day after day. It's worthy of it. Let's look at the seven. The legalistic gospel. And hear me, these things are, uh, I'm not saying that Portions of these are wrong. I'm saying that they major on these things. They major on them. Legalistic gospel, salvation that is attained by the works of flesh instead of the free gift of God by grace alone. It, it leads to think, um, if, if I can do this, I can earn it. If I do resonates fast for three weeks, woo, God's going to love me more. Hallelujah. No. Okay, let me just... Okay, I got a confession to make. I didn't really fast all that perfectly during the three weeks. I saw these snacks in the, in the pantry. I was like, ain't nobody here right now. Let me just grab a little chip or two, right? It's funny, but here's the deal. God doesn't love me anymore any less. Even if you didn't jump on the fast with us to see breakthrough this year, God doesn't love you any more or any less. A fast and what we called was nothing but an invitation to the more of God. It's no harm, no foul to the love of God upon your life. He still loves you just the same. The humanistic gospel, a gospel centered around man instead of the glory of God. This gospel is focused on the happiness of man through the sacrifice of God instead of the glory of God through salvation. The happiness of man. What can God do for me, for me, for me, for me? What can his blessings do for me, for me, for me? Now hear me. He did for us. But when we major on make it all about me, we have detoured from the true gospel. Number three, the convenient gospel. Hello. A gospel that promises everything but requires nothing in return. I'll give you everything, but I don't require obedience. I don't require sacrifice. I don't require the praying and the reading your word. You know, uh, this convenient gospel I see in a lot of young people. It says, hey, follow Jesus until it's inconvenient for you. I lost a few friends along the way. Er, then th their pursuit of God stops. I'm losing stuff in my life. That gospel stops. They, start go, they stop going after Jesus. They, they pull back on the steam on the reins a little bit. Because now it's inconvenient. You mean I get to lose? I have to lose something? I don't want to lose anything. But Jesus said you got to lose your life. That means stuff that accompanies it as well. You know, the scripture is Acts 24. It says several days later, Felix came with his wife, Jerusalem. Hold up. If you're... <clears throat> If a name is Jerusalem, whoo, that is intense. Your wife is named Jerusalem. Okay, let me just, that just was, I'm just, I read that, I was like, Jerusalem? Okay, I need to talk to these parents who named her Jerusalem because that is just mean, okay? All right, several days later, Felix came with his wife, Jerusalem, who was a Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him talk about faith in Christ Jesus. But as he's discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened. Go away for now. When I find a more convenient time, I'll call for you. See, he had a hidden motive in his heart. 
He was wanting something from Paul, but when Paul was given the straight stick, righteousness, self-control, judgment to come. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, I thought it was just the Jesus that the wealth and rich Jesus. Okay, he requires of me, but he's gonna. He wants me to live this way. Okay, yeah, I'll come back at a convenient time. Beloved, when God starts requiring stuff from us at a deeper level, don't don't push back. It's for your own good, our own good, that we get the more and our more of God in our lives as we diminish our own. The prosperity gospel. Hello, don't shout me down now. I love money. Okay, I'm just here. Here it is. This promise is great blessing of wealth and riches, but it does not require wholehearted love back to God. This gospel seems to reject any form of suffering that the Holy Spirit would use to shape us to become like Christ. Let me tell you something. God will allow you to go through stuff, not because he's a bad God or some dude with a whip slaving you around. No, he allows you to go through stuff because it peels layers back on our mind and our heart that becomes more like Christ. That's his chief end is to be more like his son, us to be more like his son. And he will peel layer by layer by layer, circumstance through circumstance until we become. It's that glory to glory verse. Amen. Okay, moving on. A crossless gospel, a gospel that is soft on sin by not addressing men's sin and guilt before a holy God. We're all sinners, right? Oh, we looked ugly before God. Boy, we looked a hot mess. If you was like me, I looked a hot mess. A hot mess. Oh, I couldn't get nothing right. And then he stepped in. And he stepped in, just washed me, cleaned me, held me. Put a robe around me. But he did not do that without convicting me of sin. Convict me of sin because it separates us. And if John 17 is true, where all he wanted to do was to be with us where we are, him, us with him where he is, and sin breaks that apart, that's why he is, has so much zeal for sin. Not because he wants to beat people across the face with it and how holy he is and how sinful we are. No, he goes, oh, guys. I can't go back on my word. I'm a holy God, but sin separates us. And so what I'm going to do is I need, to un- I need you to understand that I'm serious about the sin in your life, even the ones that creep on the inside, bitterness, envy, lust, not just the outwards of adultery and pornography. I'm not talking about only that. I'm talking about the inward sins as well. It brings a chasm with the relationship of God. A non-eschatological gospel. No end in view. Imagine running as a track runner with no finish line. Dude, I'm out. <laughs> Hello, I need something. To, I got to have a goal in mind. Just, just running. This is it, man. I don't know. We're going to keep running. Out of steam, we will. Right? We got to have a finish line. And a gospel that doesn't give the finish line is no gospel at all. There is a finish line with eternal glory, as I was talking about. In Acts 17, 30, it says, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Jesus says this in Revelation 22, And behold, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me. Now, as an athlete, I I like a trophy. I like a reward. I like something that I can show. (laughs) Hold up before everybody. Woo, I did it, y'all. I made it. I was obedient. I did all the things he asked me to. But that's real. We get to hold up a trophy in heaven how we lived on the earth because we made it to the finish line and we have our eyes set to finish the race, letting every weight off of us to run swiftly without hindrance into eternity. The grace gospel. Hello. 
This traps more people than I can count. This gospel promotes Jesus and diminishes him as Lord. Savior and Lord. Savior and Lord. As a former uh, Marine, uh, I had to have people tell me what to do, when to do it, how to do it, what to look like, when to look like it. And you had to be sharp. We were enlisted when we got saved, by the way. Everybody in here got some cami greens on. <laughs> you enlisted. God gets to tell you what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. And it is our reward to say, I'm ready. Whatever you need me to do, Father. I don't care if it's the most menial thing ever. I don't care if nobody ever even sees you told me to do it, and that's my glory. You told me to do it, and that's my glory. This form of a gospel is prevalent and lived out, uh, this, this Savior-only gospel. It's prevalent in, in people's life that doesn't like to be corrected. I had a guy, it's like, man, you know, uh, it's hard to do this whole Jesus thing, Cade. Got saved. Let me just say this. Beloved, it is not okay to get saved and still be sleeping around. It's not okay. And when we hear that gospel that talks about Savior only, it says, hey, it's okay. It's okay before marriage and, and uh, whether guy or gal. It's okay before marriage. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. He just loves you. Beloved, yes, he does. He does. But he halts you at taking advantage of the grace of God. He puts it as a halt. It is not a license to go sin because that precious blood that was shed on the cross, and he loves you. He does. But it's not a license to go, woohoo, he going to forgive me anyway. And, and I'm only saying this because I used to think like this. Well, if I do this, well, my mom said that you can ask forgiveness. And okay, so, so, and I'm planning out my sin. <laughs> I'm planning out sin. Oh, God help us. We can plan out our sin and say, well, he has to forgive us. Beloved, that is in the wrong spirit. But if we non habitually sin, we have a great advocate who we can say, Father, forgive me. That was wrong. And by the way, by the way, we're not sorry because we got caught. We're sorry because we hurt God. We have reduced repentance to being uh, just remorseful. Repentance means, God, I'm sorry, I hurt our connection and I hurt whoever I hurt relationally. I'm going to turn and not do that anymore to the best of my ability. Saul had tears when he was trying to murder David and found out David cut the edge of his cloak off and said, there's no evil in my heart. Saul, why are you persecuting me, bro? <laughs> huh? Why are you doing that to me? I could have had you, but I didn't. David, uh, uh, Saul goes, Saul, I mean, David, my son. Oh, and he has tears in his eyes. And guess what? The next chapter, he's trying to throw a spear at him again, sending 3,000 mercenaries. He wasn't sorry. He was remorseful because he got caught. Repentance says, God, I heard our connection, and I'm sorry. Forgive me. Press the delete, move on. Don't hang out in there. <laughs> Don't hang out there. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You just go to life just saying, I'm sorry. Don't do that. That devalues the blood of Jesus as well, by the way. Right? We splash in the pool of, I'm sorry. Paul says, where sin is multiplied, grace is multiplied. What then shall we say? Should we continue in sin that grace may multiply? No. He goes, absolutely not. Can you imagine Paul thunder his voice? Absolutely not. He's serious about this. I think the perfect um, scripture to just 
clear up the residue of this grace gospel, Jesus as Savior only and not Lord, is Titus 2, 11 through 13. And uh, um, Susan, you can go ahead and come up. I'm closing here. It says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us. You hear that? The grace of God that appears to us teaches us to reject ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensible, upright, and godly lives in this present age, awaiting and confidently expecting the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I mean, what else must we say, right? It appeared to us. It teaches us. It keeps the end goal in mind. There's a day coming that he's coming down and he's coming back. And we're going to see him face to face. We're going to see those nail-pierced hands. We're going to see that wound in his side where he was pierced. We're going to see those nail-pierced feet. Beloved, and how we live today shows what we believe about the true gospel. How we operate in our workplace and our friends and our families. Beloved, it's real to God. And this, this precious thing, I want to challenge us to defend this thing. Now, I'm not saying go on Facebook and say, well, you know what, brother or sister? No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying how we live and how we interact. When people ask us about our faith, we are bold, we're humble, we're clear, because that is the power to salvation. That is the power to change and shift someone's life, as we saw in this baptism last Sunday powerful God infusing his life in a human vessel that's powerful not diminishing our personality not diminishing the way we are but infuses his life in ours to partner with him forever the gospel we've responded to in the past or believe in today will determine how we live in the present and how we live tomorrow I'm going to say that one more time that we can stand the gospel we have responded to in the past or believe in today will determine how we live in the present and how we will live tomorrow. Let's stand. I'm just going to pray for us. Anybody got any lost family members? Anybody got any lost friends? Whew. Let's pray for them real quick. Father, oh, Jesus. Let the gospel penetrate our unsaved family members and friends, Father. Let the purity of your word and the power of your gospel that brings salvation, the true gospel, not something that's different, God, but the one that you preached and Peter and Paul and the others preached. Father, I ask that we will be agents of that gospel, that we will be live it out, preach it under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And I ask you, Lord, for salvation to occur as you did in Stephen's life as we saw that baptism, that awesome testimony. Father, do it in our lives as well. Let it be a prophecy into our lives as well, our unsaved family members and friends, believers that are on the fence, that's dibbling and dabbling in the world and trying to be in the church too. Father, I'm asking you again, would you save them, Father? Would you convict them of sin? Bring them in again, Father. Set them on the straight course, on the narrow way. Father, convict them of sin. I ask for salvation to prevail in our family and our friends, Father, and use us to do it. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, thank you for that word.